Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Deer Society Podcast. We got a really cool topic for you today and a really special guest in Deer Society Studio, Mr. Ben Rising. Big bucks are in trouble all the time when he's around. Um, He's got some really good information for you. We're going to have some good conversations. Uh, We're going to talk about woodsmanship. What is woodsmanship and what do you look for when you go into the woods? Some of the things that you should pay attention to, especially when you're looking for big bucks. So really exciting stuff today. Thanks for joining. Ben, welcome to the Deer Society Podcast, man. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it's always fun to be here and talk deer and visit with uh, one of my good company sponsors, I guess you'd say. Yeah. If if you've watched Deer Society, you've obviously seen Ben or you've seen uh, his show, Whitetail Edge. And if you know anything about Big Buck Killers, Ben is one of them. Uh, he's had great success over the years and, and shot lots and lots of big deer, um, kind of all across the country, different states. Uh, had another really great year last year. Uh, I guess we can kick it off. What Tell us a little bit about just your year last year and, and how that went for you. Uh, it was a good year. I killed four deer, um, four bucks in a span of 12 days. So we called it the 12 days of carnage on our, this year, you know, when we're pumping these videos out, which we just started releasing them just this past Monday. So, uh, should be pretty epic. Um, had some fails too, though. I, I had, uh, you know, rough year this year, as far as like missing a deer, hitting one bad, hitting a branch on another, um, I'm not used to that, you know, but it happens. So it's, you know, I'm human and, you know, um, so you just got to pick yourself up and it was, uh, and we still were successful. So I think that was something that was good for me too. You know, like it's never easy. Like, excuse me. I think people see the videos and they think that we just walk out there and, you know, one sixties and eighties run to me, but that's really not how it works. You know, I think people, get to they get so used to seeing a certain person shoot those kind of deer that you know they just automatically think it's easy for me or like it's they don't understand how much our my true fans do though like the ones that really watch whitetail edge and the ones that have followed me for years they know how hard i work at it but it's always the new people or the ones that you know and like i have to remind myself i have been doing this for 20 I think it's 21 years I've been filming deer. So I'm dating myself as to how old I am. And, uh, you know, it's crazy to think about that. But I was trying to actually figure out how many bucks I've shot on film. And I I can't even tell you. I mean, I'd have to really. But I've been doing it since 2001. um, For, you know, started with the Drury's, obviously. You know, they're the, the Drury's are the ones that got me my start. And. They still, you know, awesomely enough, our relationship is awesome. You know, they supported me when I left and they understood that, you know, things have changed. I was with them 13 years. So, um, and I actually kind of took a break for that one year and then moved on and started Whitetail Edge in 15. And, um, you know, the first episodes aired in 15, which was, uh, you know, it was a learning curve, you know, trying to do a web show and online stuff and just try to get it get it there so it it worked out um beyond blessed where it's been today but it's still not my living i think a lot of people think i deer hunt for a living but i don't you know i'm a logger timber buyer you know forestry by trade that's what i do every day so um and that brings us to that part of woodsmanship but yeah i mean last year was a great year you know no matter how good a hunter you are you're going to make mistakes and but you got to learn from them and you got to have that tenacity to uh never give up I think that's a major part of these big deer um a guy that used to kill or film me a lot kenny bevins who's on my team now too kenny always would say he's filmed me kill a lot of deer and he always would say you know ben was the guy that when he gets an opportunity he makes the best of it like he figures out how to so whether it's getting a shot or a big deer living there or he just said you always seem to make the right moves and i never really look at it that way but you know it's neat to see other people kind of tell you about yourself, like what they see in you, you know, like Javen that filmed me last year, Javen just always said, he goes, there's just something about you that's different. He goes, when you hit the woods, it's like you get 
like you just like a new face comes over you and you become a different person. And he goes, you just know, like when, you know, like when I hung the stand for the deer, we called scissors, you know, I literally turned to him as we were hanging his camera stand and I looked at him through the crap, the V of the tree. And I said, this deer don't stand a chance. I knew I was going to kill that deer. You know, if he was there, I knew I was going to kill him, you know, or get a chance. I don't know how to explain that, but it's just that confidence, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, and that all comes out in our shows. You know, we try to produce that, try to talk about it. We try to explain woodsmanship and all the tactics we use, you know. Well, and that's some of the coolest part about what you do. And it's so engaging for us to sit here and do hunt breakdowns with you too and watch Whitetail Edge because, you know, all that confidence, as cool as it is to hear it and see it, you know, that all comes with experience, you know, and, and you learn, you've learned that and you've crafted this uh, vision and trade over the years and applied it to, uh, you know, killing big bucks. You know, we joked about it uh, the other day or yesterday. Um, you know, you have the, all these people out there or a, a lot of people that, you know, sit back and they say, or come up to you and say, you know, well, if I was as lucky as you or I could, I could hunt the properties that you hunt, I'd shoot big bucks too. Well, maybe, but maybe not. There's so much more that goes into what you do and what we all do to, to get on big bucks. It's not just showing up and, and killing them. You know, it's, there's so much, uh, Intel and, and education that's been learned and then applied and looking for those right spots. And that's something that we want to talk about today. Again, you're going to, what you need is experience out there. That's, what's going to make you a better hunter, but hopefully listening to this podcast and listening to Ben and some of the things that he looks for in the woods can help you. And you can apply some of these things when you're out there looking, you know, in the fall and, and maybe make your chances a little better. So, you know, Ben, what is woodsmanship? And, you know, just from a, to start with, from an overall general kind of uh, basis, um, you know, what are those things that you think people should really pay attention to when they're out there in the timber? Um, well, you know, let's start, I guess let's just start at my beginning so I can explain to you how I became, how I learned woodsmanship. Um, I grew up in a little town in Ohio, Northern Ohio. And, you know, a lot of people think Ohio, they think Columbus or Cleveland or city, but like where I grew up, it was not like that. Um, you know, and then I, I sense now live two hours South where I grew up even more remote, you know, a lot of Hills and uh, rough terrain, stuff like that. But my dad was a trapper. He was, you know, fur trapper. That was his hobby. Um, you know, that's what he liked to do for and he and he liked to predator call. So he already had envision you know he already knew about scent from fox trapping he knew about your wind from predator calling you know setting lures and dirt holes so that fox would be downwind of that lure to get the best chance to pull them to your dirt hole set or vice versa um he taught me a lot about like you know i, I learned the contour of land like you know edges and you know, swales and just, you learned, as, I learned at such a young age of how animals read the land. You know what I mean? And to this day, I still feel that there's some people, it doesn't matter how much time they spend in the woods, they'll never understand it. Like, it's either you can get it or you can't. It'd be like me trying to learn um, algebra. I'll never get it. You know, I'm not that guy. I'm not a book guy. I'm not a computer guy. That's why I have to hire people like Dylan and people that I have, you know, to do because I know I'm not, that's not what I do. You know, I have the visions of how I want things to look or how I would portray it or like, you know, you're an awesome editor. You and Adam like are just mind blowing. I can have those visions, but I would never know how to bring that to fruition. But me, I can walk into a piece of land. And I can just see the forest for the trees, so to speak. You know, I can just read it. I can read it like a deer would. I feel like, I don't know how you say it. I feel like I'm looking at the land through a deer's eyeballs. But, you know, I didn't even start deer hunting until I was like 13. You know, I trapped, um, you know, did that and predator called with my dad and, you know, squirrel hunted, rabbit hunted, that kind of stuff. But all those animals have relations to the woods and to how the land is laid. Woodsmanship is not only towards you know, timber ground. It's just in general outside knowledge of, I feel of, you know, knowing tree species, knowing what animals eat, knowing, you know, and every area is different. And that's what I've slowly learned. Like 
hunting different states in my time, you know, like hunting Kansas or Iowa or Illinois, there's different species of trees, different things, um, different kind of soil types produce different types of, and, you know, you can soon start to look at aerial maps and things like that and know what you're looking at without ever even stepping foot on it, you know. Um, I mean, I've literally bought farms sight unseen because I know what I'm looking at on a map and then get there and they're exactly what I thought or better, which is really cool, you know. Um, so in a sense, it's a gift, but it's also something you can teach yourself, you know, if that makes sense. Do those things change that what you're looking for throughout the year? Like, um, I'm sure spring, summer, there's different things, you know, deer use different properties, different ways, food, bedding, whatnot. But like, you know, you killed four bucks in 12 days last fall. A lot of times you're getting to those properties and you're just, you're making the moves on the fly. So like, what are you looking at in the fall that really separates some, some properties, um, compared to, you know, different times of the year? So I would say that's one thing that separates not makes me better than other people. But what I'm going to say is like people like Don Higgins is a great hunter, very um, meticulous at planning and staging his hunts. Okay. People like Mark Drury, um, you know, just a genius at setting up their farms and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, but, but any one of those guys can kill deer. You know, a lot of these, a lot of people mistake that these pro hunters have just come by it easy. But what they fail to realize is that all of them at some point in their life were young at one point, hunted differently, hunted. They've learned to get there. Like you still, you know, I've said it many times. You can take a guy like Mark Drury and drop him in the middle of nowhere. And he's never been before. And he still will figure out a way to kill a deer because he's still that guy, you know, in his mind. Um, same with Terry, you know, all these guys, Waddell, you know, Waddell was an amazing turkey hunter, you know, things like that. So that's all woodsmanship too. You know, they've learned those skills over the years of how to perform. But what I'm good at is because I, for years, I never had my own dirt. Like I didn't own my own farm that I actually hunted on till about two years ago. Um, and I killed the, you know, I killed my first deer last year on dirt that I actually owned which was a special feeling, you know, because I've grown up my whole life. I'm 48 now and I've grown up hunting public, private, doing some leasing, you know, things like that. So I've hunted so much like everybody else out there, but everybody's goal is to really like own their own piece of dirt, you know? So me and a buddy of mine, I have two different buddies and we bought a couple different pieces together because it's hard to swing it all by yourself, you know, but it's opened the doors to just enjoying a different part of my life. Like of having something that you can actually say, okay, this is mine. Um, I'm going to benefit the deer through what I'm doing in the wildlife. And, you know, I'm going to give back um, instead of just take. And, uh, but what I'm really good at is being thrown into a situation with current issues, like right now, like, you know, going to a spot, never even being there before and then being successful. Like that's where I'm really good. Like, and I think I, I've learned, and I think this is why, like, as time goes on, because, like, me and Dylan were talking on the way out here, like, I don't have a lot done this year as far as cameras up in different places. And, like, I'm starting to learn that I can really waste a lot of my time by getting too, because I'm really good at just, when it's time, okay, what's here, let's go find it and let's kill it type of thing. Um, that's my strong point, being able to read the instant, but it's nice to know on farms that you have or places you can know what could be around, you know, and slowly build that pattern. But I think it's really uh, can can fool you to get too excited June, July, early August as to what might be on your farm. And all of a sudden it's gone, you know, because food sources change. And, you know, so that's that can be one of the hard parts about running cameras and getting, you know, deer can move on you. and they don't all move, you know, I think it's all some deer different. Some deer stick around year round, but then some deer I've had literally in the past, I've had deer show up within the hour, a year apart on one day and never see them again. 
I mean, I've only had one deer actually do it within the hour, but I literally had that back in 2012. And I've talked about this before. He did it in 11 and 2000 or 2010 and 2011. Same day, a year apart, within the same hour on the same camera. Was that a mature buck? Yeah. Well, he was, he would have been four, then he turned five, I would say, but he was a stud. I mean, like it was a deer, like, oh my gosh, I wish that deer would stick. But he never did. He just was passing through. But why he went the same, I just mind boggling to me, you know. Um, so let me ask you, when you are looking at a piece of property, um, you know, let's take one that you haven't been on, for example, you walk onto that piece of property, what are you looking at? You know, so you have this vision and you can see how, you know, the deer use it and how you maybe want to use it. What are those things in particular that you're looking for? Is it trees? Is it terrain? Like, just walk me through your process of, okay, I'm going to hunt this piece of ground. Like, how do you approach it? Do you want to be more specific and actually break down like a scissors? Yeah, so I think can we'll, do... I, I, yeah, I think we'll get to scissors, Okay, but I, I kind of want to just like a broad. general broad yeah. vision here of like things that you would look at. So I look at access. That's the first thing. How does the farm lay? What are my wind? What are my predominant wind directions going to be? So then I know, okay, well, you know, what areas can I concentrate that I'll be able to access undetected? Is it top access? Is it bottom access? You know, what kind of, if it's all flat ground, that's one thing. But if you've got some roll to it or some terrain, obviously your top access or keeping your wind consistent is very important. Um, you know, where's the food sources, either, whether it's on the neighbors or this farm you're hunting or wherever, where are those deer destination? going to be in the evenings where are they coming back from in the mornings um you know water sources you know creek bottoms swamps bedding cover you just try to break it down as to what that farm holds or what that piece holds whether it's 20 acres or 50 acres or you know 500 acres or a thousand acres of public it's just a matter of trying to start breaking that down and sometimes it can you can do it quicker than others and you know but the best way to really figure all that out is to get boots on the ground. And sometimes you just got to get aggressive um, and scout and make some moves. And, you know, I try to observe on new properties. Like if I just get access to a piece and it's already hunting season, a lot of times I'll try to observe from a distance first, see what the deer are doing. And then I start making moves from there. But if I know there's a particular deer we're looking for, like the scissors hunt, well then, you know, you don't start seeing that deer, you know, you got to start moving till you figure out or find what you think you're looking for. But I obviously with big deer, you know, I like to find those little pockets where he's going to feel safe, where he's going to feel like he's not being intruded on all the time. Um, and there's so much talk out there that I see with, um, between magazine articles and other podcasts or other shows and different things that, where everybody has this certain idea of exactly how deer live. Like, you know, does will bed here. Bucks will only bed here. You know, does always take the best cover. Bucks get the worst. Bucks bed in the back. Does take the front cover. That's all BS. I mean, it's all relative to how, I mean, I've killed big bucks super close to a parking lot on public land. You know, I've killed, I've had certain bucks that bed right by the food on a food source on a farm you know then i've had some that were way in the back you know they always would walk a long distance to get they just felt they just preferred where they lived on that knob in the very back of that farm some feel good living in the front it just every deer is different so you can't you literally cannot go by what i say or anybody else all the time you literally have to be your own person it's just like we were talking yesterday like dylan was explaining to you um when you were doing his breakdown about how like he would call me and ask me like, what would you do here? You know? And I'm very like, I try not to get too deep into that because, and we get those messages all the time on Instagram and Facebook. And I, and I love that people trust in us that, you know, they could ask us those questions and we try to answer, but what you still have to make them understand is that like, I can't tell you for sure. Cause I don't know your property. I don't know your deer. I don't know. I can give you an idea where I'd look, and what I think they could be doing according to the terrain. But that's what I was trying to teach Dylan last year. Like, you know, 
you need to make your own mistakes or your own. That's how you learn. That's how my dad taught me to trap. I mean, literally, like I watched him for a little bit, you know, I'd tag along in the pack basket or, you know, tromp to the snow with him, whatever it was. But eventually it was, he slowly, you know, but I had the desire too. I wanted to do it. Like, he would give me my own traps. I would wax my own traps, you know, boil them, wax them, dye them. And uh, I'd do my own thing, you know. I can remember the first time I caught a possum, I was like crapping in high cotton, you know, like, yeah, I got my own animal, you know. And uh didn't matter, if, you know, I didn't like getting skunks. But, you know, then I started catching coons. And then, I mean, I literally got pictures, you know, and I... I I've said this many times, people, you know, I've done so many podcasts, but I talk about it, but it's very important, like, because red fox are like one of the cagiest, smartest little creatures with scent capabilities. And I mean, they'll literally dig your trap up and turn around and take a dump on it. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll just, they want you to know, they know coyotes will do the same, but I didn't grow up with coyotes. So I never trapped coyotes where I lived. We didn't have them. And then they started moving in later in life, but I was so into deer hunting, I wasn't trapping but um, coyotes, I guess, are kind of the same thing. You know, very smart, very, you know, they'll let you know that they know. And But when I was 12 years old, I was catching red fox. Like, you know, I was running my own line on a three-wheeler and literally catching red fox in leg holds by myself. And my dad was, like, super proud of that because, like, you know, I mean, I remember going into the fur shop and people would accuse him that he was trapping them and just... I was taking the credit and he's like, no, he's not, <laughs> you know, but I used to go to like Tom Miranda was one of my big idols when I was a kid, you know, I used to go to the trapping conventions and he would, Tom Miranda would be there putting on, um, demos, trapping demos, you know, how to set traps and do that. You know, Tom may not know that, but Tom was a huge influence in my life. He, he wrote books. He was from Ohio, you know, and I'd entered those, they called them dirt hole contests as a kid where you'd set traps and, you know, who could set the dirt hole the fastest, whose trap was bedded the best, and, you know, just everything like that I did, I took real serious, you know. And I, I wrote my first article in the Buckeye Trapper when I was 12, you know, about trapping, you know. But I since kind of got away. I started to write some articles for deer, you know, um, like for some couple magazines like Bow Hunter and that. But it was every time you'd submit something like that, you know, like they'd ask you to do it. And so I'd do it and, you know, it would come out good, but just wasn't like you'd sit down and for the amount of time and effort you put into it, like you just didn't get much out of it, you know, so well, stuck to the filming. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, you've had so many experiences that have molded you into really the, the, for lack of better words, the big, the big buck hunter, the big deer hunter that you are. You know, one of the things that I've really noticed in in watching you over the years is that not only do you have this passion and knowledge and just knack for getting on these big deer and being successful, you know, the things to look for and to find them and get in the right areas. But when you find those areas, it seems like you're never afraid to now there's you, you do this strategically, but never afraid to make that move and get in there and and get it done when it needs to be done. I think there's a lot of people who, you know, might have that, not the same vision, but you know, when they find something like that, maybe too scared to make that move or not make the move when it's the right time. I feel like watching you over the years, you've always had that, taken it one step further and known when to make that move and when to get in there. So now JJ, to your point, I want to get into scissors. So the scissors buck is a buck that you shot last year. Um, coming out on Whitetail Edge. We just did a Deer Society hunt breakdown on it. Let's walk through just that whole story because I feel like it's a good example of everything that we're talking about in this podcast. So give me kind of a rundown of, of Scissors and that hunt last year. So Scissors was a deer that was on a farm that, you know, I didn't even know about the deer. You know, I didn't even know this landowner until my contact at Novix Tree Stands had, you know, was good friends with this guy. And he actually hunted that farm some. Um, Caden did. And then he, Ryan, the owner of the farm, you know, had only owned the farm, I think, like four years, four or five years, something like that. And, you know, good hunter in his own way, but a guy that, like, he wants to learn. Like, he's passionate about it. He wants to do the best for his farm, you know, and he wanted to learn more. And 
they had a big deer on that farm that they'd called scissors, you know, and he ran the whole neighborhood there. And, you know, a lot of the neighbors were trying to kill the deer and, you know, they just weren't having any success. And I'm not saying that they never could have killed him. It's not that, it's not that I'm that much, you know, uh, it was just part of it was probably timing, you know, too, that I got on it. Cause Ryan actually, you know, after the end of it all, Ryan was pretty, he was on that deer. He just didn't really know it um, so much, but you know, I think some of it is, is that, you know, so then, you know, I get there, I get to that property and like, they offer to let me hunt the deer for a farm consultation. Like, Hey, Ryan's like, tell your buddy Ben, you know, cause I killed one in Illinois already. I'd went to Kansas, killed one. So then I was headed back to Illinois um, cause I had two tags cause you know, I own ground. And so he was like, tell your buddy Ben, if he wants, he can come hunt scissors. But if he kills it, I want to get a farm one way or the other. I want a farm consultation on my farm. I just want to know. I want to, I want to hunt my farm better. I want to know it better. I want to know what a guy like him would look at. And I thought it was crazy. I th thought they were kidding, but they turned out to be serious, you know, and met ryan and he was a great guy i mean like super it's funny how hunting has brought certain people into your life that like wow like you know you just really thank god like dude's a good man like you know we're good friends now like he's talk all the time we text it's really cool and um but getting back to that so like you know i take him up on this invite like who's not going to go hunt a giant 10 point you know sure I'll come, you know, for one, it was kind of a challenge for me too. It was like, I'm digging this, you know, here's a deer that a lot of people have been trying to kill. He's, he's legendary in the neighborhood. Um, he's got an aura about him that, you know, even the name scissors was awesome. Like that's just wicked sounding scissors, you know? So to me, that was just really a, like, okay, Ben, let's put your skills to the test, you know? Cause I like to test myself. You know, and like a few years ago on people were always hitting us up on the juries, you know, about, well, let's see you guys go hunt public land. You know, you can't do it on film. Well, I went to public land. I missed a 170 and then killed a 158 inch eight point within three hours, you know, of each other. You know, I just screwed it up. I was trying to sell film and missed that 170, but I got on him. I scouted that farm and me and my buddy Jake out there, we scouted it, figured that where those deer were at hung a stand the next morning i missed it and then by 145 that afternoon i killed another big mature deer i think i still could have killed that 170 if i would have stuck at it because he didn't even know what happened but so that was cool like that challenge you know and it was all on film and drury's produced it and then you know i killed another one on public land not too long after that um in ohio um i didn't shoot him on public but he walked off public onto private like literally i was 20 yards onto the private ground. I just, it was a better tree to hang in. And I had permission from the guy to hunt there. So I hung the stand there, but that deer was a public land buck. He was 180, you know? So those challenges are awesome. And it'd been a while since I had been challenged like that from somebody else in a sense, you know? Yeah. So when I go there, you know, and meet everybody and, you know, obviously you're, you've got to look at the map and that's the first thing I do. I start looking at aerials, you know? Um, and look at many different things, but like what I said, I try to find, okay, you know, where are the food sources? How can I access these spots? Where do I think this deer could be living? Where have possibly other people have seen big bucks? Just trying to just gather as much information as you can. And then some of it just comes by gut, what you do. You know, sometimes I even look back and go, I don't even really know why I did what I just did, but I just did it. You know, and that's what like Javen would say to me, my other camera guys, like you just, it's like, you just make moves in the woods that like, you don't know why you're doing them, but you're just doing them because you know, it's right. And, and that's where something with me, I guess I'm not as calculated as some people, you know, some people have a real calculated moves for everything they do or an algorithm, so to speak, like Mark Dury does, you know, the guy's like a wizard when it comes to just, you know, his knowledge of deer and deer movement him and terry both you know they've created deer cast i mean that's like the most crazy app ever but how they've done it and they've fine-tuned it over the years it's literally insane how it works you know like it's the best timing for everything and it's pretty incredible but they've been a student of that their whole life you know they've been 
they didn't know it, but back when they were young guys filming the first episodes, they were creating DeerCast because over all their years, they kept track of how things, and then finally as they matured into such good deer hunters and was able, they could put, they started putting all those pieces of the puzzle together and it became what it is. And so it's a great tool for any hunter, seasoned or not. Um, but so I start looking at things like that. Well, what's that weather going to be the week I'm going to be there? What's the barometer going to be? All those factors play into hunting those properties. Like you can be the best woodsman ever, but if it's everything just doesn't work right, those deer are not going to move. They're going to be stagnant or they're not in the right mood to move at the right times. Or, you know, obviously we know the the breeding phase of the rut, you know, like seeking phase, pre-rut, All those are all times that those deers, you know, those big bucks start getting their hormones running and they're on their feet more in daylight and let their guard down a little. You know, those are great times to be there, but there's other times that are better, you know, or just as good, whether it's cold fronts on food sources late in the year or when they're hungry, they got to move, you know, stuff like that. It's just knowing the animals. I kind of get off your questions, I know, because yeah, my well, mind just... So you were hunting scissors, but it took three days to get on them. So we'll kind of walk through maybe day one, you know, what your mindset was going in from maps into the ground level, what you were looking for, and then just kind of take us through that process. Well, basically on day one, it was an evening. We went up there on an afternoon, um, and we wanted to hunt. Like, okay, we know there's food this way. He had been seen that way on cameras, um, on the neighbors, you know ryan's thick stuff what i thought were the real bedding areas could be which turned out eventually that's where we did kill him was in that bedding area but we just never i thought i'd start on the edge overlooking a lot of open stuff see what we could see i, I could see a long ways and i wanted to just observe and put myself in an observatory spot too where i thought if i saw him i could call him to me or maybe even get a shot just by his natural walking of how i thought he might use that area um, we hunted a morning and an evening, or we hunted at the first evening. The next morning, never saw him. We did see some bucks and some different deer, but never him. Um, didn't even see really the action of like deer acting the way I thought they should for that time of year. You know, it's early November. It was kind of warm, you know, unseasonably, not unseasonably warm, but pretty warm. And the mornings were cool, but then it would warm up through the day pretty good. Um, hunting in just light long sleeve shirt, you know, basically in the evenings or a hoodie. Um, so then the, you know, after that first morning sit, I decided to move down into the bottom a little bit. He had a food plot down in there established. And then there was a hillside of oak trees. This property was made up of, you know, ridges with oaks, old strip dirt with, you know, overburdened that had grown up into locust and briars and, you know, with a swampy creek bottom in it, with, it separated the oak ridges from the strip dirt. And then above the strip dirt was crops. Um, and the deer would just go back and forth. There was just trails, a lot of deer sign on this farm. I mean, lots of deer sign, um, lots of deer. But, you know, trying to figure out, okay, I got to, the one thing too is it's a huge block. Like this deer could be anywhere in that whole block of these neighbor's properties. So for one, you were not going to kill him until he's there. Like, I didn't even know if he was even there at that moment. He could have been off on a doe because, you know, on a different farm. So you then try to figure out, okay, where can you put yourself in the best position where that deer might show up when he does come to that farm, you know? So, and they, even they all agreed that they didn't think he bedded any certain place all the time. Like he moved around. Um, and a lot of times big, big deer will do that. You know, sometimes they have a really small core, but then some of these big surviving deer that like get some pressure, they know they shouldn't do the same thing a lot. Like, I don't know, like they don't always do it. They don't always bed in the same little hole all the time, you know? Um, but anyways, so, th you know, that next morning we hunted, we didn't see anything. So this would have been like the third sit. We moved down into the bottom more towards the Oak Ridge, kind of where some ridges met down in the valley. And I thought, well, maybe we catch deer coming down to cross the swamp to go up, you know, out to the crops. Um, saw some mature deer, didn't, didn't get on scissors, didn't see them, didn't even see the sign there that made me, because we were kind of scouting and hanging, didn't even see the sign that made me feel like this is this deer. 
this big of a mature older buck. I didn't even see that sign. I saw sign, saw good deer, but it wasn't what I was looking for. So I wanted to give it a morning. You know, we hunted that evening in there, saw those deer. We went back in the next morning. We saw some deer, but not the movement I wanted to see. And I told Javen, I said, it's time. I got It's time to dig. Um, so we pulled the stands and uh, put them on our backs. And we started going to the area in that thicket, you know, along this, follow the creek north through all that swamp grass. I said, I want to follow this creek, find some crossings, and then I want to follow those crossings into the bedding areas of that overburdened strip dirt. And I think that's where we're going to find what we need to find. You know, if he's going to be here, I think that's where he's going to be or will he'll show up. So that's what I did. We started trekking, and eventually I stumbled across the area that made me feel like this is it. I mean, I got, I literally got chills when I stepped up on this ledge and walked into it. I was like, this is it. I knew right then this is where he's going to be. And because the sign was incredible, just giant rubs and you can just tell a really aggravated deer, you know, like that's what those big boys do. Like every really big deer that I've killed that I was, that I was like knew where they bedded or found where they bedded. That's what it was. Like it stunk. I mean, it was shredded. I mean, scrapes everywhere. Like there was no mistake. Like he's telling you, this is mine. Like, you know, and it was just incredible. And it wasn't a very big area, but it was pretty wicked. Even Javen was like, wow. <laughs> you know, I was like, this is. So we instantly hung the stand right there. I was like, because it was perfect access to follow that creek in. It was a long walk and it was a noisy walk. But if we did it in the mornings, we could get up in there from the backside, hopefully catch those deer coming off the fields back into that thicket and bedding area, pushing does around, whatever. That was my plan. So we instantly hung the Novix tree stands in a small tree right there. Didn't have a lot to pick from. And uh, that's where we ended up settling. So when you're walking up, and was it a cedar bench, I think you said? the other Yeah, so it's kind of a mixture of locusts with some cedars. Um, You know, not very fertile soil at all on those overburdens. They don't grow a lot of oaks or anything like that. It grows a lot of trashy timber, you know, but it's great for browse and bedding and thickets and, you know, for the deer to spend time in during the daytime. And he he could just bail off the hill and have water and cover there. You know, like he could bed there. He could... He could look down and smell from behind or vice versa. You know, he could do whatever he wanted, but he could get out of there so easy without you ever knowing that he was even there. So when you're walking into that and you think it's a pretty good spot, are you, I mean, what's the wind direction? Is it blowing, is it in your face? Or are you worried about blowing him off of the spot? At the time I wasn't, I didn't care if I jumped him and saw him at that point. I'd be like, okay, well, at least I know where he's at and I know he's here, you know? And then I just making a move from there. A lot of times, I mean, you hear about these guys, doing bump and dumps, they call them or whatever, you know, and and a lot of those guys have success. You know, I've typically not that kind of hunter, but when you've only got so many days, sometimes you do have to get a lot more aggressive and get out of your comfort zone than you more than you want to. Um, And I kind of knew that And my plan was I, I needed to go home anyways. I'd been on the road a while and I needed to get back home. So it was, I was only going to hunt another day or two. And then I was just going to leave cameras up, go home for a while, let the cameras tell me what was going on and come back. Um, so I wasn't too worried, like if I did bump him or ruined it, you know, but once I walked into that spot, I I was like, okay, we got to hunt this, you know, and I got to give it some time, you know, at least a day or two. And w- when you're walking in there, like what's, cause obviously if you start crossing deer's path, this, especially this buck's path, he's going to figure you out when he's going to access you to get to your stand. So are you walking, you know, is Javen... 30, 40 yards behind you. You're no, we were right together. And you I mean, just kind of back out the minute you figure it out and you just go straight back or? Well, when I first walked into it, I did, I stopped, you know, and Javen was below the hill behind me. And I was like, I caught him up there and we kind of stood there. I could see what was going on. And I was looking at this bench and I was like, so I kind of was like, you know, obviously at first you feel like you're, you know, wearing kitten gloves, you don't want to just tear through it all. But I'm like, got to, we got to find the tree. We got to be able to hunt here. So, you know, we got to do something. So I, we walked, I literally walked right through the scrapes then, 
you know, because I wanted to see. I needed to see what was there. I needed I needed the mat. I needed the book to tell me. I needed to read the book. How's that sound? You know, I needed to read that. Read it. So I read it, and then I made my choice on what tree to hang in, and how we could access from behind, and you know, cross minimal deer trails, you know, and just hope that the deer would, you know, not cut the track that we laid to get in there. But you know, we we literally walked right through all that stuff. And I when I was standing there, like I I did I sprayed a little deer urine on my boots though. I used the black widow deer lure urine and I sprayed some of that on our boots and we walked right through that stuff, did what we did, and it wasn't a breeding scent, it was just regular deer smell. And did everything we did and we hunted that evening and we literally had bucks walk right right across our trails. I mean, they'd stop and but they didn't like freak out you know and i think that's that whole combination of using phase on your skin and the lotions and you know you're you're trying to seal your your skin up you're not dropping dander everywhere you're you know even though you're moving around and working it still helps minimize all that stuff but i also think there's a time too when you can get away a little more with stuff too you know there's a time of year when deer kind of slut their guard down it's not like it's the first week of season you know, and that deer is only there bedding, you know, like he's there all day long and then gets up in the evening and moves and comes back early in the morning. This was a situation where, you know, this deer was feeling his oats. Probably he was coming back to bed later. He was looking for some girls. He was, you know, and sometimes they're not even using those bedrooms, but I knew when he was on the farm, he would walk through there. Like that's just his comfort zone. He's going to walk through it, going to the next doe bedding area. So that was my plan. That's how we were going to catch him, I figured. So <clears throat> you hang the stands, you know, do you, you got him in him right away that night, right? We're not, we didn't see him that night. We saw a mature deer that night, a couple. Yep. Yeah, I'm saying you sat the stands that night. We sat the stands that night. We hung them right then and sat. And then we never left till dark, got out, went out the back door, then came back in the next morning the same way. So let's jump into it, unless you got something else you want to ask there. Well, I was just going to. Maybe dive into that tree. I know you pick tiny trees and crooked trees and um, kind of whatever you can take or whatever you can get for the spot, especially with the cameraman. So kind of walk through the tree you picked, um, why, what it looked like, um, backdrop. I mean, did you? Did you yeah, so basically it? it was a small hackberry tree, you know, not a very big tree around, probably 14 inches maybe. Um, and it went up and had cedars growing within it. So... It kind of really limited us to how we could shoot. We had to do a fair bit of trimming through the cedars to get some holes, but it also gave us a lot of good cover and to hunt low, um, which I don't like to exactly hunt low, but it works out well for me many times, you know, over the years. Um, and I wanted the tree right on the bank to where it was going to blow my scent over the strip bank out towards the swamp. So anything below me pretty much wasn't going to get me. It could come right up behind you and like, probably wasn't going to get you till it was either right there or maybe not get you at all type of thing. So, um, you know, then I, you know, after trimming all that, you know, setting the stands, giving ourselves some shots, getting his stand, you know, hung, you step back, you look to make sure you got the cover you think. And I, I really believe cover is a major key, you know, and having a stand that you can use that you can adjust. And cause you know, like I had to level these stands, you know, and that's what, you know, like I use Novix, you know, and it makes it easy to be able to adjust them, hang them a little bit sideways if you need to, adjust the platform so you're comfortable and you're not feeling like you're going to fall off the thing the whole time or in an awkward position where you can't concentrate on shooting. I don't want to dive too deep into it, but you say cover. Is that backdrop so you don't have a silhouette or is that something in front of you to break out both. your outline? I like both. both. Okay. I like to be able to have a little bit. I'll literally take some of those cedar limbs when I'm in a cedar or close to a cedar and I will pile them in front of me like a kind of make like a little bit of a nest in a so to speak so that if i need to move my hands or that movement isn't always just picked up like that um but you got to be careful by adjusting altering the, the scene too much like you know like you're you got to remember when you're in a core spot like that like that deer knows everything the like key it's like photo memory in his brain of what everything looks like in his core It'd be like me, you know, like I don't smoke. It'd be like somebody walking into my house 
that had smoked or just had smoke on their clothes and walked through my house, I'm going to smell that when I come home. Like, I guarantee you I will smell it. You know what I mean? And it's going to set me on alert like, whoa, what's going on? Or finding a cigarette laying in my driveway. Um, those deer are the same way. Like, so if you alter that too much and then he comes into the picture and he sees that, that he doesn't like it, like, wait a minute. That could be just enough to make him turn, you know? So you got to be careful. I, filming, we have to trim enough to film and shoot. Give yourselves the opportunity. But you just try to do it and hope you do it right that you don't, you know, mess up, you know, make it too altered. One of the statements that you made yesterday, which I found kind of interesting, was um, big bucks make big bucks sign. So, you know, you said that when you got to this bench, you just knew that was the spot. And I've heard you say that before, you know, you, you just know it's that spot. You had mentioned that, you know, when looking before you saw some other sign, um, you know, just walk me through that. Just explain that a little bit. So big bucks make big bucks sign. Um, you know, what, what differentiated big time the sign that you saw there versus the sign that you saw other places? Mm. Well, just the size of it, the aggressiveness of it. Um, you know, you can, little bucks will make sign, young, young, immature deer, you know, smaller rack deer, they'll make sign, you know, one thirties, they, they get aggressive, make rubs on trees. You know, they will rub a big tree at times, but they literally won't sit there and start on rubbing on a tree like that or shredding it. Like, I mean, literally digging, grooving that tree, breaking branches, you know, they'll rip up those little saplings and, you know, them three inch trees and think they're tough and work on them. And the big bucks will too. But them big bucks leave those signpost rubs. I mean, they go in there and they will literally, when it's his bed, because this is what these deer do. You have to just envision to yourself this big bastard just sitting there all day long, chewing his cud, you know, gets up, stretches, takes a dump, walks around a little bit starts making his scrape, pees in it, goes over to this tree, starts thrashing it, rubs on it, walks a little bit longer, it's not time to go, starts doing it again. He just spends that time in there just doing his thing, browsing around a little bit. He may even come back and lay back down. But they just spend so much time right there that that's what it looks like. I mean, he, had, he literally had four scrapes around one cedar tree. And, I mean, they were dug. Like, this deer was letting everybody know that, like, this is my spot. And, you know, you can see other deer tracks in it, you know. But And I'm a firm believer, too, that those does will seek out those bucks. They will seek out the dominant buck. I know they do. I mean, I've watched them go to those areas looking for – I've watched – I watched one time from a tree stand. I watched – Three different does go into one hollow where I knew this big deer was living. And literally, they would go down into that hollow where he was at. And I only ever saw him two times come to the edge. Like, he would follow him up to the edge and he'd stop. Never come out. They'd go down. It was almost like, you ever seen the movie Conan the Barbarian years ago where... He had he was breeding all those like all the women were lined up at his cell and like it was just like this is what was going on. I'm like what a gigolo, you know. Mm -hmm. He knows what the, he just they're gonna come to me. But he was that kind of deer. Not every deer is that way. That's just how he was geared. He just didn't want to leave his hole. He didn't have to. And I mean the pressure around there was severe though too. Like he knew he was being hunted hard by every neighbor that was even. And there was people hunting him that weren't supposed to be hunting him. I mean, this deer was getting hunted hard. He was big. And so he knew not to move. But it was just so cool to watch that, like how them does would literally go to him and breed with him, you know, and stick around. And it was just kind of cool, you know. Yeah, I was just going to dive into that bedding spot a little bit more. I was kind of curious on your thoughts if this is something that's common or just specific to this specific bed. But you said like there's some cedars in there. I know we're familiar with hunting around pine trees and stuff and the wind, it really affects wind flow. Mm -hmm. seems like some of these beds are just this like real stagnant kind of swirly wind spot where you said you could smell them when you got in there. You know, is that a typical thing you see? I know you always talk about deer bedding with the wind of their back, but it seems like these beds... 
like these big bunk beds are like this weird, there's a wind, a weird situation there where it's just really swirly and it's like they can pick everything off. Yeah. So like, you know, and not every deer, like I know some deer will bed in complete open timber, like big bucks will. Like everybody thinks it's got to be thick or they won't bed in open timber. But if he feels safe and he's not being messed with, he will bed in that open timber because he can see forever. You know, like, and I think, I think more big deer bed in them kind of spots more than people think. I really do. I think they, especially if they know how to get out of there, you know, but they love to be, it just seems to me when you're in any kind of country with terrain or hill country, it just seems to me that most of them bed, like, I guess I would call it that top three quarters of the hill. It's like a quarter down from the top, three quarters to the top. Does that make sense? Like they like to be in that. And it may not be a giant hill either. You know, it may not be a big hill, but that's just seems to be where they always pick when it's a hillside. Um, if they're going to bet on a point or off a knob or, you know, and they'll bet up against like old treetops or old logs or even though up, a lot of times a classic is an uprooted tree years ago that may be rotted away, but the root ball had uprooted and it left that indent in the ground. There's always deer beds in those, always. Um, they'll just tuck right down in there. And I mean, literally, like the public ground in Iowa, I can think of many times where like literally you could just envision how that buck would get in that, lay down in that hole and just, he could just stretch his neck out and just lay there. You know, almost flat, comfortable like a bed. Like, I mean, almost like you made me want to get in there and go to sleep. But like, you know, you could just, you could just see what he was doing. And like you could walk by that deer so easily at a distance and never even pick him out because he was so and I think that happens a lot. I think those big bucks have nerves of steel on public ground and you know pressured areas. I think they really sit tight. Like they they wait till they you know, as a kid growing up, I used to drive deer with neighbors and stuff, you know, and I mean biggest deer always would wait till the last second to get up. I don't know if you ever experienced that, but they would. I mean, you literally sometimes almost had to kick them because they knew what was going on and they knew their chances of survival were tough as it is. There was people everywhere. They just knew if they moved, they were in trouble. And a lot of times they would turn and run right back through you, you know, instead of going where you're trying to push them. So bucks are just masters of survival. I don't, they're just a different animal. I don't know how to explain it. That's why they get so much respect for me, and I can't get off of them. Everybody's like, why don't you hunt anything else? I don't know. They just drive me crazy, man. They just like, it's what I, it's my passion when it comes to hunting. Yeah, it's it's cool because everyone's different. You know, everyone acts a little different. Every area is a little different. You know, the strategy is as much as there's the same kind of tactics almost, like every each situation is different, you know, in its own way. Like you said, there's a lot of variables in each one. So jumping back into the scissors hunt a little bit. So you find this area, you hunt it that night, you hunt it the next morning, you don't see him and you still don't know at this point that that scissors is there, right? So yeah. Well, so then the next morning, you know, we we go through the plan, we go the, the long way in, along the creek bottom, up the back side of the strip bank. In my mind, I'm expecting if he's around, he's going to either cruise through there at some point mid morning, you know, work his scrapes. Um, you know, looking for a doe, going to the next bedding area, whatever. Coming in off the food with the doe, who knows? You know, that's just, we, we really tried hard to keep ourselves from being exposed in any of the open ground, like towards the fields or anywhere. We didn't, like even in the dark, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be seen, um, you know, as a person. Um, and that morning we literally drove my truck through the alfalfa field to the back of that field where typically you would walk or whatever. But in the dark, I did it you know, in my vehicle, because I felt like that would be less spooky to the deer, even if they were in the field, like, okay, it's, well, it's a truck, we know where it's at, we, you know, but we were going to go a long distance away, so I did that too, um, but, so then we, you know, we made it in there, it was a little noisy, going through the dark in those weeds, we weren't using a lot of lights, you know, um, and got to the tree, got settled in and it just felt right, man. It was just one of those mornings waking up in November and you're just like, dang. 
you know, like this is so epic to just be sitting here and enjoying what you've created. And I, I literally was doing that. I mean, I was just sitting there just thanking him for, you know, amazing sun coming up. It was just awesome just to be there. And like, I'm in Illinois, man. I'm hunting a giant deer. Got a bow in the tree. I mean, how cool does it? It doesn't get any better than that. Like, you know, don't tell my wife that, but, uh, you know, it's awesome. Like, there's just no feeling like it. And I'm sure every different, like, elk hunters, mule deer, everybody experiences that in their own way. You know, that's why I don't start elk hunting or deer hunting or mule deer hunting, because I know that I'll probably fall in love with it. You know, and it'll drag me from what I love to do like this, you know. But, um, so just sitting there as things are starting to wake up, you know, you know, you could just tell things were starting to move, you know, and it wasn't long. Um, started to see some doe, you know, moving around. And one was nervous, like I was saying yesterday, you know, she was blowing a little bit. Um, I could, and I could tell she wasn't blowing like scared, like blowing that, like, oh, I got to run. She was blowing at that, like, leave me alone. You know, like, I don't want to be messed with. Like, I'm not ready. You could tell that it was a buck pushing her around. Like, and I don't know if you've ever seen bucks chasing a doe through the woods where the doe was blowing the whole time. You ever seen that? You know, and um, I could just tell that's what she was doing. And then I heard him grunt, heard the grunt. Like, it was a big, big set of lungs. You know, I was like, that's a big deer or a mature deer, anyways. It isn't no three year old <coughs> or no, you know, forky or anything like that with those little bang, bang. You know, this was a, and I'm like, oh, so I could, I knew something was up there with them. I couldn't see them. They were up the next bench. And in my mind, I just figured that's what they were doing. They were coming back in off the food. He was following those back into the bedding area. I thought, well, any minute he might just come right down in here, you know, or that doe was going to take him off or whatever. We didn't know. So we just kind of had to sit there and wait a little bit. I did grunt a few times with the extinguisher just to see if maybe that would be enough to pull him, but it just wasn't enough to make him, you know, at that point break. And I watched another buck come through there and I heard him push that deer off. Like you could just hear that, <laughs> that rustle, like, you know, and it wasn't no antlers catching, but it was, I could tell what he was doing and he was pushing that deer away and that little buck come down through, he was about 120 inch deer and he just kind of went on his way and up through the next knob on, you know, looking for his own doe. And I'm like, dang it. He's up there. Like, I just had that feeling. I was like, it's sucker standing up there. So finally I turned to Jave and I was like, rattle. Going to start out slow, try to get his goat. We're in his core. Hopefully it'll, you know, piss him off. You know, that's what I was trying to do. Like, get his goat. Like, what are you doing in my room? You know, I, this is my spot. And especially being I could tell he was aggressive and he'd push that deer off. I was like, well, maybe if I sound like two deer, it might be just enough to get him to come down here, especially because I didn't want him leaving with that doe. Because if she wasn't, it could take all day for him to come down in there. So I was like, he's in the mood. He's aggressive right now, so let's try it. You know, so I grunted again a few times, like a buck chasing a doe, like brant, 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 with some, you know, some flutter to it, like some movement and getting kind of how you'd call it, but getting, uh, trying to add some momentum to it. And then I grabbed the horns, like the two bucks, like another buck come onto the scene. They met, started to feel each other out and then got more aggressive. And then I just quit, you know, and put them up. I didn't want to get like crazy, like a, like a typical hunter, just, rah, 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 rah. you know, he's probably heard that a hundred times. So I was trying to really remake a deer scene, like the live thing of him on a morning of the rut. And it wasn't, I don't even know how long it was, but it wasn't long and crack. I heard a stick break. His, I could tell it was his antler busting a stick off a tree coming because he was coming, you know? And then I looked to my right and I was like, oh my gosh, there he is. There was no doubt it was scissors. And he just come walking right off the bank, right into us. And I mean, stopped one time to sniff around just a little bit. And at that point, when he, as soon as his head cleared an aspen tree, I drew. And I'm like, this is going to be, he's going to be in my freaking lap. Like, 
and the trail goes right underneath my tree. Like it was, and I, the day before I had actually cut a small tree down and tried to block that trail just a little bit. And it could have screwed me either way where their deer come up behind me, you know, it could hurt, but I was envisioning him coming from the top. So it worked out because when he was coming that trail, I don't know if he saw it or what, but then he just kind of stopped and come to the edge. And I think he was going to look down in that swamp bottom because he couldn't see the deer. Like, you know, we'd made that noise and he couldn't see us. So I don't know if he went to the edge to look down, but that was just enough when he was starting to get close to that edge and there was nowhere for him to go. So he was either going to leave and not give me any shot, but I, I got him to stop then right there. I just went, and he stopped at 12 yards and he just went like that. And he looked right at me. You could just see it in his eyes. He's like, done, you know, and I shot him. So That's awesome. Well, obviously a heck of a deer and, and you'll be able to watch that hunt, uh, uh, deer sight hunt breakdown end on whitetail edge. Um, you know, a special deer how rewarding was it and how rewarding is it for you every time that especially you know situations like this where you go in and it's like you you're doing the you're getting intel on the fly and you're doing your homework and a plan like that comes together how rewarding is that for you it's it's rewarding because what it does is it, it takes me back to all the years of leading up to that you know like when i first started getting on big deer and figuring it out but i mean i can remember um being you know, 13, 14 years old and walking through the snow with a notebook when I was a kid and in the places that I could hunt and looking back how bad I screwed up everything, but I was learning. Those were all, some of those green moments are the best memories of my life. Like really of like deer hunting, like those moments where I was so unsuccessful or made horrible shots on deer or, you know, and that's all, that all makes you better. You know, if, if you if you can learn from it, if you can't, then you're never going to get out of that. You're going to be in that same zone your whole life. But, you know, I remember watching uh, my dad brought home a video one time. It was like the first hunting video I ever watched. And it was bow hunting October whitetails with Barry Wenzel and those guys. I don't know if you ever saw that. Yeah. If not, you need to watch it. It's a classic. Um, I still have that DVD. But... Um, and you know them talking about how they would make patterns and like keep notes and so you know i get my notepad out and i start walking in the snow looking for trails and marking all those down drawing a map on my little notebook and you know just slowly started doing that all on my own and i never killed a really big big deer till you know my first booner i was 26 i think 26 years old 25 something like that and it was that was the first year i ever killed for juries on film and uh, my wife killed a 150 that year, so we made the team. But uh, the first year was a 184, nine point. But um, I'd killed a few deer before that, you know, good deer, but not a booner, you know. But I can remember sitting there going, man, I just can't imagine what it'd be like to shoot a 180, you know, one time sitting in my stand when I was like, you know, 20 years old. You know, I, I was married. I had, I had some kids, so I was like 24, but just sitting there going, dang just to shoot one booner, just one 180, man, what would that be like? You know, cause I'd killed some forties and things like that. And I'd caught glimpses of big deer, but there wasn't a ton of those big deer where I lived growing up and uh, they've killed some really good deer up there now. But, you know, I could just remember thinking those thoughts as such a green, but I was getting it at that point. I was learning. I was putting my woodsmanship skills to the, you know, to I, I'd killed many deer. Like I was, it, my problem was then I was a killer. Like, I just couldn't let him walk. You know, 120 is coming by, he's going down. You know, it, it was earlier years. I just was bow hunting. I was, and I didn't have a lot of time to hunt. I was logging every day. And so, you know, I had an opportunity. It was dead. And, um, but then I finally was like, okay, I got to step it up. And, but I remember just like I was saying, I was sitting there thinking, you know, man, if I could just. You know, and now here I am, 48 years old, and I've killed, I don't know, what is it, 15 booners, Dylan? You know, 15 deer over 173, two in the 200s, you know, multiple 80s, you know, a couple in the 90s. It's just, I don't know, it's very blessed. I mean, it's, you know, and I give God the glory for that because, like, he's the one to give me the talent, you know. 
Well, there's, yeah, definitely blessed. And obviously there's a little bit of luck that comes with anything, but I can tell you, you know, when I was able to come to your house that uh, there a couple of years back and you walk into that room and you see all those deer, I've been fortunate enough to see a lot of places and a lot of guys trophy rooms. And I, there's, there's not many at all anywhere that compare to what's in that room. And, and it, it, the, you know, the success and the video and, and the strategies, I mean, the proof is there. It's, it's not just luck. You're obviously doing your homework and, and you're amazing at what you do. And hopefully, you know, people listening to this and people that watch your content, you know, can take a little bits and pieces of that and add it to their own heart, hunting arsenal and, you know, try to make them a little better hunters, or at least, you know, like sitting here talking, it's, it's cool because, you know, it, it lights a fire in me and I'm sure you too, JJ, like it gets you excited and it gets you thinking already, you know, for the season. And, you know, I, take these little pieces and, and use them, you know, I, and don't be afraid to go and, and look, I think so, so many people out there, you know, get complacent. Maybe they just have one spot that they can hunt or they have one tree stand set up and they're going to sit there and you know what, they're going to, they're going to complain about not seeing a big deer or whatever, but they're, they're not, af- they're too afraid or they just don't know how to go out and look for what they need to be looking for or to make that move to, to do that and put the odds in their favor. So hopefully, you know, if you're listening, you can take little bits and pieces of that and hopefully help you this fall. I mean, that's one thing I, you, you have to be very persistent. If you really want to be successful at harvesting upper end deer and no matter what state you live or where you live, you know, we always say that, you know, those deer are relevant to the, where they live, the size that they get racks, you know, a five-year-old in West Virginia could be totally different than a five-year-old in Iowa but you know mature deer mature deer but you know i get so many like and the thing is is like the deer you saw at the time and you know like i never owned ground till just two years ago so like and you know only one deer last year that i killed that the first 180 t post you know he was on my own dirt you know but that's the first booner i've ever shot on my own dirt it's always been on somebody else's ground a lease or private land or public land so I've worked for those deer in a sense that anybody else can do it. Like don't, one thing is have confidence in yourself. Some people I think can feel like I may be a little, be a little bit arrogant. I try to be very humble. Like I can be in a room full of people and they'll never know I'm a deer hunter. If, you know, if they're talking deer, I'm not going to tell them, oh yeah, I've killed this or I'm the, you know, I don't do that. Um, I remember one time, this was hilarious. I'll just tell this quick story. I remember one time with juries, um, we were, <clears throat> did the dream season hunt and we did a hunt down at Terra down South, you know, and um, I could just tell that a lot of those guys, like the guides there just thought we were just dumb TV deer hunters, you know, and um, they were just doing their job to guide us, you know, and this one guy would come over there and, you know, I grant you, I had two coon dogs at home, one world champion, you know, I, I mean, I'm freaking hillbilly straight up you know, cut timber my whole life, you know, I mean, live in the woods, just whatever. And, uh, but this guy come down and he was sitting there like, you know, almost like asking us questions. Like we wouldn't know what we were talking about, you know, and Terry Drew is just sitting there. He's being very polite, you know, and this guy's like, how many bucks you killed? You ever kill any big bucks? You know, we got some really big bucks down here, you know, and just kind of, just kind of razzing, you know, and, oh, that's not a bad deer, you know? Finally, I could just see it. And Terry just got agitated, and and he because he said to me, the one guy goes, he goes, you got a coon dog? Like you coon hunt? And, you know, like he was just amazed that, you know. And Terry was, and the guy goes, so then he was asking me about the bucks, and finally Terry put his hand down and he goes, that kid's killed more big bucks than anybody in this goddamn room. <laughs> you know, he just lost it because people, they, it, it's just constant. Like they think. They always ask you, well, if I could hunt where you did, or if I could, well, I could do that too if I hunted where you did, or those. But you know what? You probably could, but you won't because you're not going to take the time to go ask permission. You're not going to take the time to go scout. You're not. So I'm, I'm saying this to encourage the people that are listening to do it. Take the time. Dylan, you know, my guy that, you know, works for me now with White Tail Edge, and I'm training him in timber. Dylan's 28. And, Dylan has found more properties to hunt on just in the last year, even in Ohio. They're not big properties, but he's got more access to more properties by putting the time in in the last two years than any kid I've ever met in my life. So you can do it. Like you learn how to talk to people. 
You put tools in your arsenal that can get you access. Like we just got sponsored by NFP Insurance. Okay, they're huge in the outdoor space. That is a major tool that a hunter should have in his arsenal. So when you first go up to a landowner and you're asking about permission, how many times have we ever heard that, well, my insurance company doesn't want, well, guess what? I got insurance. You know, I can cover your ground through my policy, my liability. That's a game changer for people. Like, it really is, especially with people with nice land that have a little money and they have something to protect. It's a, that's a tool that I'm telling everybody out there they should look into. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not trying to plug NFP. I'm just saying NFP is an insurance company that knows how to do that. So if you can find an office, work with one of those people. I mean, they, they insure people like Beretta, um, tree stand companies, Novix. They, they insure um, what was one of the ones we was looking at the other day, Vortex. Um, yeah, a bunch of guns. I mean, but just lots of different outdoor space type companies. So they know how to deal with that stuff. And that's just something that gives you an extra tool in your arsenal to get access to someplace. You know, everybody says, well, I'm just stuck to hunting five acres or public ground. You're going to get told no a gazillion times. But that was one thing I never, I never gave up. Like I look at Dylan now and I think back when I was his age and it was the same thing. That's why I know Dylan's going to be a successful big buck killer because he doesn't give up. And I never would either. I mean, and people used to get so mad at me where I lived because I would get properties to hunt on that, but you know, I was willing to work for it. I would literally agree with the landowner. You know, like a lot of people tell the landowner they'll do something for him, but you got to perform it. You got to do it. Like, you got to mean what you say and be sincere and you'll be successful. You'll get properties. You'll it may take two years, it may take four, but eventually you'll break them down and you'll get access to some of those places that you never thought you could. Well, kind of a, a interesting spin or twist on that kind of looking back at what ryan did to you and having you his name was ryan right yeah yeah having you in and having you know basically saying ben you got free reign to shoot this giant 180 inch buck i mean that's kind of a crazy concept but looking back at that obviously he's there to learn what types of things maybe this is a good conclusion like what are the maybe top three things that you maybe showed him after you killed that buck on that consult that maybe he didn't see or he did different than what you know, you saw when you got boots on the ground or like your vision, his property, what were mm -hmm. kind of like some differences there? I think some of it was, um, for him was maybe taking advantage of the most recent information he could get. And then knowing how to enact that plan of like when the deer was around or, you know, with today's technology, let's not kid ourselves. You know, cell cams have changed the world as far as, you know, and I don't want to say that they are, I don't literally just go jump in a tree 10 minutes after I get a pit. I don't do that. But what I'm saying is it at least gives you that information of when deer are around your farm or when they're on their feet, what times of day they're on their feet without you having to go and intrude and pull cards. And, you know, and it's why it's becoming a very controversial subject. I think, you know, a lot of people consider it to be cheating um, or giving you too much information. Um, you know, I don't think it goes that far, you know, I think baiting can go that far. You know, I think people rely too much on, and a lot of these people that, you know, hammer on us about, well, you know, we could kill those deer too. But a lot of those guys are just staring at a bait pile all day long. They have no idea how to hunt any other way. You know, they're going to go buy a bag of big tine and dump it on the ground, which, you know, good for them. But in some, in a lot of times it'll work. But to be consistent, you have to have a lot of different skills, you know, to be able to scout and, Learn your trees. Like I, I, that's one thing that you know. I encourage people to learn forestry a little bit. Learn what trees produce acorns, and you know the types of trees, and you know what trees are basically worthless for deer, um, what trees aren't, you know, and what bushes and browse that they prefer, and you know, like so many people are afraid of logging. Logging is one of the best thing you can do for deer cutting. I mean, it literally is. Like what God produces through logging, Mother Nature wise, protein and nutrition through new growth around clear cuts and places not even just clear cuts i'm not saying you have to clear cut but a lot of clear cuts are happening you know southern states and different and that's where a lot of the big deer are in ohio it's a lot of select cutting you know manage old growth hardwood forests stuff like that 
But anytime you do a select cut within a year or two, that property completely changes for the deer that are in it. So pay attention to those things when you're scouting, looking for recent logging jobs or past logging jobs uh, close or on your property. Those are going to be, those are going to be like a food source Mecca, you know, early fall for deer. I could go on and on, you know, scrapes, you know, you just name it, but I'm a huge scrape hunter. You know, I'm big on that. Well, so much good information there, Ben. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and everybody today. Um, lots of good stuff. Hopefully you can take some of it, enjoy the stories, and and uh, put it in your arsenal for this fall. We're out of time, so we're going to cut this one off. Thanks for joining us again, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe on YouTube if you're watching there or download the free Deer Society app. Lots of good content coming from Ben uh, this past fall. Hunt breakdowns, and obviously you can obviously uh, and you can obviously check his stuff out on Whitetail Edge. Um, so much good information to to learn and, and enjoy there. So thanks for tuning in. We'll catch up with you next time. The Deer Society's success has been built on great partnerships with great product makers, such as Illusion Systems, maker of the Extinguisher Deer Call, the Black Rack Rattling System, and the Phase Body Odor System, Tacticam and Reveal, Osseo Gear, Ten Point Crossbows, Burris Optics, Huyman, and Big Frig.